Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Fong, and with me is a guest today. We have Adam. Greetings, Adam. Hi. How are you doing? Thank you for inviting me. Yes, hello. Thank you, Adam. Adam's actually a listener of Watching Silent Films, and before we get there, uh, I just want to say, Watching Silent Films, we pick a, a movie or a series of films, shorts, we watch and talk about it. That's all we do. Um, as you are noting, our regular co-hosts are not with us. Um, uh, Lily is actually uh, taking a, a little bit of sabbatical because she got a new job. Yay. But also that, you know, it's kind of challenging in terms of the hours. And so once she figures that out, um, she may return. So, uh, you know, anybody who's uh, participating in this, uh, we just give them a choice to say, hey, anytime your life goes crazy, you can always come back. So that's what's happening with uh, Lily. Diane is uh, not going to be with us from here on. We we decided to try her to, to kind of do some podcasting and just just wasn't a good fit. And so she's, she's going to basically move on. And if anything, maybe guess in the future. But for now, uh, not going to be a regular co-host uh, of Watching Silent Films. But today, we have a guest. Uh, Adam, he's a listener of our podcast here and you know i just uh, we try to reach out to everyone who's interested in silent films who's interested in not just listening and watching it but also talking about it and he was and so that's how i found him <laughs> um just ta- just give us a real brief sort of history of uh you know how you got into silent films what sure. your interest lies in silent films and uh and see where okay. how'd you find um, us essentially so well, um, as far as silent films themselves, I'll work up t- until I found you. Um, I grew up in the 70s watching 60s television, but 30s films really attracted me for some reason because it was so different from everything I found. I was aware of silent films, but didn't really get into it because it was always treated as a joke with uh, the woman tied to the railroad tracks with the, with the piano playing going you know crazily next to it. Uh, as time went on, DVDs came out, and that's when I think I really started to get into uh, silence. And beyond that, I found out certain companies actually restored the silent films. Um, I've been going in and out of interest, uh, working up uh, to it. Uh, this past uh, year and a half, I think it was, I've been looking for podcasts that would fit that need so I wouldn't have to really be watching it by myself because it's pretty much impossible to find someone else that's interested uh, around me. I did a search um, on my podcast. Uh, I have an Android, so I go through CastBox. And I finally found you. And I think that's when my education really took off. Um, Before that, I read a couple of books to do with Lillian Gish. She wrote one about D.W. Griffith that really fascinated me. Um, I read a book with um, uh, Pickford and uh, and her, you know her life and everything like that. Um, but it, when I listened to your podcast, you kind of solidified it for me and focused it. And um, I've been what I'm really appreciating is the fact when uh, musicians seem to be hired to score music to the films, much like movies you see now so it actually makes it more interesting when you sit down and the two come together um now i'm hooked awesome yeah thank you you're welcome and thanks for listening (laughs) now (laughs) you're participating are you gonna try to listen to yourself (laughs) oh definitely definitely perfect i'll I'll probably hate my voice but uh that's all right that's everyone (laughs) don't worry about it i know that (laughs) All right, so that's perfect. Um, and if you've listened to my podcast long enough, you know how I got into silent films. So, uh, but for listeners who are new and just kind of on a whim picked this uh, episode, uh, I got into it uh, because I took a very quick intro to film in high school um, in the late uh, 90s. And there was a book by Gerald Mast. Um, and Bruce Cawain, I think, who edited it later on. I think Massa had already passed on by then. I can't remember. It was around the sixth or seventh edition of it. And in that book, it basically, uh, the title of the book was called A Short History of Movies. And in the back in the appendix, it actually had a, a list of uh, the most well-known or I don't know, the, what, whatever that book 
in the index deems to be the most important work of movies to watch all the way from the silent era to the modern era. And so I decided, you know, after, uh, you know, I completed school that I wanted to take, uh, a primary research. What I mean is I wanted to watch the movies themselves instead of reading about it. It was fun to read about it in the book form and, and sort of just uh, film critic analysis, sort of, uh, putting your analysis hat on, but, um, I just really, I would, I really wanted to see it and I wanted to start in the beginning because I have a little bit of, um, uh, OCD about it. I just wanted to start anything in the beginning and, and start there and work my way and see if I can last. And so that's where I started. So I left silent film era and back then Netflix was, uh, renting DVDs. If you remember those days, but that's what their primary business model was. I got the most expensive plan at that time, which was eight discs out at the time concurrently. Wow. And I basically just devoured it, uh, you know, all the way from the, uh, you know, Trip to the Moon, Meliers, and Edwin Porter's uh, Great Train Rambo, all the way through the late, uh, you know, 20s and 30s. Whatever was available on DVD, I basically devoured that. Whatever is in the book that I could get my hands on that was available on DVD, which at that point, DVD had only been in infancy for about three, four years, really. So, anyways, it was really good times. Um, I I basically exhausted that list and I watched as much as available that I could get my hands on. And then life took over and I, and I started like college and stuff like that. And so I, it didn't last long, but I, at least I think I covered most of the uh, the silent era and I really enjoyed it. That's how I got into silent films. It's probably That's probably about, what, 20 plus years now, I think, at least 20 years. So that was the last time I really heavily watched a ton of silent films. Uh, and only in the last, I want to say, three, four, maybe years, I kind of, uh, I'm coming back into it uh, with a little bit more of a maturity and more grown-up perspective. <laughs> at least yeah. I'm hoping. I don't know. <laughs> we all you, you never, in your own internal voice, you never think that you're grown up, like ever, you know? You still... Uh, I know that feeling. <laughs> always stuck, you know, in your... You I'm know, forever teens. 22. Yeah, whatever that uh, <laughs> age you want to be stuck at. So, yeah. Anyways, I, you know, um, Netflix offers because uh, I listened to your podcast talk about that earlier, uh, and I checked Netflix. They actually have a list of movies under female directors, and it's all silent. And some of them are pretty uh, fun to watch. I think I had mentioned that actually in one of the episodes, but that was that's been it's the uh, early uh, yeah. w- women filmmaking yep. by Kino. It's the whole collection, the three uh, DVD or Blu-ray collection from Kino. Uh, the early that I don't think I knew. I just yeah. saw it as a Netflix thing. Yeah, so that's what they did. Is they 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 had a money license uh, thing deal contract with uh, Kino, and they said, "Hey, listen, give us this uh, title here." And but but you know what happens with those is. That's what Kino does. Kino is the publisher of these movies, and they go, okay, so uh, you know we have these film preservation films, remastered, restored from Library of Congress or wherever sources they get it from. They collect right. them, put them out in the DVD, but then they get, they got to figure out how to distribute this digitally. Well, who's the big big ones around here? So they look around like Prime, they look around Netflix, and they go, hey, you know, w- are you willing to pay X amount of money to just to show these content and your streaming platform and netflix happened uh-huh. to say yes to kino and it's it and so they put them up there but you know what in i don't know how long maybe a year or two later it's gonna expire and once that contract expires they usually go back to the original content right holder and say hey do you want to renew and they're like no that's too expensive for us and then yeah. it goes away again so that's normally how it works and so was well, one resource i was really happy that you told me about is uh canopy oh yeah yeah, um, I didn't realize that existed until you were uh, talking about it, and it took me a while to, to figure it out because my town doesn't offer it, but I can do it through the Peabody Library. So, Yes. Um, yeah, um, it's a lot is there. That and Criterion. Criterion has a lot, too. That's because all of it is licensed through, like, one uh, company. It's probably yeah. owned by either Criterion or Kino or yeah lobster film or whoever there's a bunch of these independent shops that have the rights to some of these uh in in the in the in the specific geo geographic region that they own uh-huh. and then what happens is they license that wherever they it is and but how canopy makes money is that it takes all of those houses and say hey uh, i'm gonna make a deal with the uh what's it now 
town or maybe state local government uh, funding and say in the year of 2021 they have a budget and so when it, you the librarian the library uh, subscriber the consumer uh, uses their library ID and watches a movie let's say I watched you know five movies this month uh -huh. well they're gonna take that bill at the end of the month and talk to the state or town and say hey this user watched the five times pay up pay up that money so then they transfer the money for the license that the number of times that they watched into the uh, the coffers of canopy <laughs> wow you've <laughs> really done your homework well that that's how they broker the the deal the problem with that is uh like if you go to like new york city it's super densely populated they actually yeah. got rid of canopy because they're just not willing to pay that licensing cost yeah so i feel like canopy is a great uh platform right now Right, but I think long term it's not going to last. So enjoy it while you can. <laughs> uh, now I'm depressed. Yeah, um, there's a book you recommended at the very beginning of uh, when you started doing this, and it's the parade's gone by. Oh yes, I uh, yeah, I really enjoyed time. that. Yeah. Um, well, the thing I got from that is he he uh, dedicated it to Abel Gantz. Yes. Uh, who did Napoleon? Yes. So I bought Napoleon. Um, yeah, that's On DVD? quite the find. Yeah, I had to get it from England, and I do have a multi-regional um, player. Yeah, yeah. reason-free. Perfect. Well, I'm an Avengers fan, too, so that's, um, you know, so I have that player for a reason. And Avengers, so the, this. Uh, the TV show? show? Okay, or the yeah, Marvel. The, the show. Okay. No, no, no. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, the show. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm my whole life has been surrounded by that show. She uh, just passed away, right? The, the star, yeah. what's her name? What's her name again? Diana Rigg. Yes. And the other one did two just before. Um, yeah. Honor Blackman. She died at 94. Wow. She was Pussy Galore in uh, James Bond. Yeah, yeah. Goldfinger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, well, I mean, that was the 60s from 61 to 68 or 9 uh, for the first, you know, iteration of it. But, uh, yeah, uh, so... I've always had, I've always kept upgrading my collection, so that's why I have a multiplayer, Excellent. and that's what I played Napoleon on. And Napoleon is, that is a good DVD set. Yes, DVD or Blu-ray? Blu-ray. Blu yeah, because that's the thing that it really is this six and a half or seven or something ridiculous. Five and a half is yeah. what they finally were able to do. Yeah, somebody uh, and plus like, oh, I was just gonna say, and I discovered Kevin Brownlow. Yeah, I didn't know he existed. He's about Miss uh, Diana Riggs' age. Oh yeah, he's up there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, like I said, I've I've learned a lot. Um, you know, you fed my passion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody's listening. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, I mean, I I was thinking we I think as a podcast I was thinking of reviewing that, but I'm like, how do you tackle a five plus hour? film how do you even talk about it do you talk about it in like five episodes or something <laughs> you know what i mean uh maybe the first it's so much disc yeah. is his childhood so that's its own story yeah uh probably just the techniques and the special effects he had to do there's um commentary under the whole thing so you know i i play that constantly just so i can remember what it is that abel had to go through just to create what he did back in 1927 or it's right. I think he shot it twenty six. Yeah, it's incredible, right? To have access uh, well, to well, you know the Brady like Bunch setup with um, was it nine squares? He had basically did something similar, and he had to rewind the film over and over and over just to get different section while taping off the section he didn't want to uh, basically film over. Uh, right. So that 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 was so meticulous. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now people are using Zoom and they can do it easily. <laughs> so that's yeah, it's just kind of how far we come. But uh, but yeah, but it's so, nice to see the genesis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, trailblazers, right? People are. That's right. it, it, I've said it many times. But I, I really, that's what I I really truly love about this era of the people who had gumption and chutzpah and people who just uh, think on their feet yeah. and is able to uh, Mickey Mouse solutions together. To, to create things artistically it's just astonishing i mean things are well you got oh, me interested in buster keaton yeah. uh i knew he existed but when you had several episodes covering him it it got me to read his book and um yeah he's an he was an interesting person yeah i 
I mean, I haven't read all. Uh, you probably at this point read as much more, much more than I have now. But I'm not sure. Well, this was in 1960, and it was the one he. Um, I'm sure someone helped him write it. He had, they had to have. Um, but yeah, it was just he had such an interesting life. Uh, I did end up looking at the one of the last ones he did, uh, Beach Blanket Bingo. I'm thinking, oh, that's so sad. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> Elizabeth Montgomery was in it, but I don't even know if they shared the same room. Uh, it was just, yeah. uh, it was just, just sad to see him do something like that. But um, what can you he do? had to pay the bill somehow. So yeah, he seemed yeah. happy by 1960, though. He said he was very happy with, uh, f- he was fine with the way things turned out. Yeah. I always, um, I, at least in my imagination, I always wanted to have. Buster Keaton continued to run his Buster Keaton studio yeah. instead of uh, oh, yeah. closing it and then working for MGM because yeah, I, I believe, I really sincerely believe that Buster Keaton would have been almost just like um, Charlie Chaplin where yeah. he, he would have a more prestigious uh, career path post yeah. the silent film era. Um, I mean, not with the whole uh, communism. A lot of his thing, stuff but, is on, a lot of his stuff is on Criterion, Charlie Chaplin. Oh, of course, yeah. His and uh, Kino, well, I too. mean, his well, not the. I'm not speaking of just the silent ones. It's it's directed by, so it's his everything he directed as opposed to everything. Right. Uh, and uh, so I I saw his talking films for the first time. Um, that was interesting. It's got deep voice, right? <laughs> was it deep? Um, I just A little re- bit. It, I think it was yeah. affectation more than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Uh, because he wanted to sound, you know, very educated. Right. All right, let's uh let's keep it sure. moving here and uh let's talk about what we've been watching and uh let's just uh uh limit to the last a uh, couple of weeks or something like that because I think I don't think we've recorded as a podcast for a while. So, in the last couple of weeks have you watched anything in the classic realm, let's say? Um well, I did uh, join, thanks to your last podcast that I heard anyway. Um, there, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it right. Perdononi Silent Film Festival. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I've never joined a festival before. Uh, you know, it's just I've always been aware of them, but I just never got around to it. Now that it was um, streamed, uh, you know, I obviously couldn't go to Italy. So, um, yeah, I was basically watching silent films for a sh- uh, full week. And did you enjoy it? Uh yeah, there was um there's a lot of different things. Uh let's see. There was one called The Crisis. Uh Bridget Helm, I think her name is. She was in uh, Metropolis as the robot. Yeah. Uh she was the the lead in this and she was just in a she was feeling neglected by her husband. I think he was a lawyer. And uh it just basically showed where hedonism goes. It was just it was by uh Pabst who did Lulu. Um no, I'm sorry. Um uh, that was the actress. Um, well, it was uh, Pandora's Box uh, the year afterwards. Um, th- the thing about this festival is they give you the best version of whatever they have, and this thing was so clear I could see dust. You know, it was just I. It's it was just blew my mind to see something from 1928 that clear. What's sad uh, is uh, not all of it, but uh, <coughs> some of the titles on that film festival won't be able to make it to a, like a DVD or any other medium because it'll just be shown at the festival. And that it's because right. of, it's because of all these rights and stuff and copyright. And, oh yeah. Which is sad. Oh, yeah. Right. Cause so that's, it's beautiful that you got to experience it at least. And uh, yeah, I was so glad you, um, you told me about that. Um, and it was only, you know, after the exchange, I think it was around $12 and you can't, that's a that steal. Anywhere. For, exactly. for, for 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 things that will basically be gone, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, they showed things from uh it was from Saturday to Saturday, so the 3rd to the 10th. Um uh, they played a couple of films and then they had like uh they would focus on musicians and how to how to sc- score silent films and I didn't watch any of that cuz you know I work. So the thing I was really grateful for is that they said they dropped it and kept it out for 24 hours after the start of when they first dropped the film. Um, so I got to watch it after the fact, and it reminded me of uh, The Walking Dead in a way, because after that it was like The Talking Dead, only they called it whatever they called it on YouTube, and I think all that is still up. 
where they talk about the movie and he on I think they use Zoom. They had musicians that scored the film that they were talking about that day. They had other people who were just very knowledgeable or somebody in that world. Um, you know, people I don't know. Um, so the whole thing, I, I was just, uh, I was just Im uh, immersed in that full week. Um, it, Italian, Greece, Japanese, Chinese. Uh, the one where, uh, uh, Sis Sis Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, uh, for those who don't know, he was the um, uh, the bridge of the River Kwai. He was yep. um, the, the concentration general. concentration camp commander. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, basically a matinee idol back then, which was unusual for someone non-white to be back in those days. Um, but the only drawback with that is they kind of had him play whatever Asian character fit the bill. Right. Um, so, but. Um, yeah, the whole thing was just, um, I don't know. Uh, they had Laurel or Hardy, which they showed the silence from either or. Uh, and there was one called it's When the Nights Were Cold. Extremely uh, rare. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know if they said they found the second reel or not, or the first reel, rather. Uh, but it's um, they had these fake horses that they would ride around in Monty Python style. <laughs> uh, only it was a prop. Looking like the horse where Monty Python didn't go that far. Right. Um, and he was just, uh, it was basically a take on uh, Douglas Fairbanks and Robin Hood. Um, wow. And just basically, you know, spoofing it and just doing one gag after another after another. Um, yeah, that's, um, you know, I don't want to take up the whole time talking about everything there, but uh, I really enjoyed it. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it and, and uh, at least got to check out some of those. Is that well, there was, uh, there was one that I, it took it, it it really took me for a loop where this it's called um, Tom and Tubal uh, Tom and Trouble oh Toodles Tom and Trouble I'm sorry um, I guess Thanhauser um, you know one of the descendants is alive and handling all that and, and reintroducing it to everybody he was asked to babysit he goes to the park he puts the baby aside to go talk to a friend not looking at the baby at all, and then after that he thought it was kidnapped, and it was just crazy. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common trope in silent films, I'm sure. So Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the, is that likely to influence you? I mean, you know, after all this COVID business is done, is that likely going to influence you to try to travel to a place like that, to, to watch the... The silence in Portland, like in in Italy. Um, I don't think I make enough money to to go in for something like that in Italy. Uh, well, let's say let's say that was not an object, right? You you would be up for that. Well, if right? they did it in Boston, I would definitely do it. I, uh, I think Somerville sometimes does it. Um, yeah, I mean, depending how far away it was, it, it's just one of those things. Right. Have you ever had a, a chance to watch anything with the uh, live accompaniment silent film? No, I wish I did. Uh, the closest I came to was the thing they have on YouTube, the silent comedies with Ben Modell. Oh yes, um, oh, he those plays are live. Yeah, I watch those every week. Uh, he play, he explains that him and his partner, uh, ex and their wives are off to the side controlling right. everything. Um, yeah, they um they they like you know the context which you've promoted. You know it's it's important to know context. Uh, and he plays live with it, so I guess uh, that's as close as I got. Yeah, it's, I mean it's like a. Uh... You know, I guess he plays on the fly. Um, yeah, Steve Massa. Yeah. In fact, uh, that's the, it. That's it. The movie that we're gonna watch today has a uh, pianist who also basically uh, played play the, the the piano accompaniment on the fly after like live oh. watching the the film. I don't know if you watched the link I, I sent you. Right. You're talking about the movie t for today. Yes. Uh, he said. Well, I saw in the notes underneath what he put down. As he added a soundtrack composed in Germany around the same time by Hans Fitzner. Uh huh. And that, that was done in 1922. That was the YouTube. That's what it said underneath. I thought it was uh, the one that was. Uh... Okay, we'll we sort that out later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, I hope I have the right movie. That's okay. No, I mean, is it Journey into the Night? Journey into the Night, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I just want to make. I was starting to panic. I'm like, oh my god, did I look at the wrong one? No, no, no. Uh, I, I, I'm, yeah, I it was. I uh, must have misread it then. 
Cause I well, I looked at the comments underneath. He yeah. wrote his thing, and then other people were thanking him for it. I see. I see. Okay. Well, we'll get there. So, um, <laughs> anything else uh, beyond the festival? Um, yeah, I watched The Unknown, uh, which I enjoyed. It's uh, They have a, a Joan Crawford uh, collection. And um, I've seen bits and pieces of her. It takes place in a carnival, and um, an armless man, uh, which is Lon Chaney Sr., throws knives at her with his feet, and she's being spun around. <laughs> it's just bizarre to look at. And I guess he was a criminal who had uh, double thumbs for some reason, and he was I, – I think he killed somebody, so he didn't want to be – discovered by the police so he hid his arms under a corset he had a sidekick that helped him do all this and then he learned to throw knives with his feet uh of course he falls in love with her and then it just went on from there well you know it's uh but it was i liked it and the music was great the music really went with it uh there was one effect that i i noticed that i'm not sure if i was seeing it right it looked like light burlap was in front of the camera to give that uh a, like a an effect uh, it wasn't through the whole thing, but it was during like uh, the romantic parts of it, where she was, you know, wondering, um, you know, if the strong men liked her or not or whatever. Um, but I, it just reminded me of the original Star Trek, where they would put something in the lens to um, to make someone look more glamorous. Yes, that's. Um, I I I mean, by the time the Trek around, that they started using uh, Vaseline, Vaseline or something. Yeah, yeah but. Yep. In the early days, I don't know what they used. I, I, some sort of filter, maybe, or some sort of... It looked like someone just put a cloth in front of it, burlap, or it looked burlappy, but yeah. but not real thick. You could see everything fine, but just with that little, you know, texture to it. Right. Uh, and, cool. I'd, and I hadn't seen anything like that uh, before, so, you know. It's a wide, vast world, silent films. Sometimes yeah, I've been, I've been immersed, uh, it, yeah. I feel like I'm living in the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one is a um, Todd Browning uh, silent quote-unquote horror. I'm not sure if it is, yes. but yeah. Lon Chaney yeah, is was. always amazing, right? And so is oh, John yeah. Crawford oh, yeah. and the whole gang. So. Uh, in the trivia, it said um, Joan Crawford up until then, she just figured standing in front of the camera was enough. But when she saw Lon Chaney, Lon Chaney act, you know, for real, yeah. she says, oh, I could, I should be doing this. And that's... <laughs> And that's what brought it up. Yeah. It brought her uh, skills up. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anything else of note? Uh, uh, no. I'm ready for the actual film. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I don't think I had a chance to watch anything in the classic realm myself. Um, uh, just uh, I've been getting into a lot of uh 4K discs lately. So some of the older films, uh, older than now, meaning not silence, but um yeah uh what did i play recently i think uh blade runner was on 4k and that was pretty amazing in 4k do they have an 8k is that no 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 so 8k that must have been a typo well so typo then so there is there are 8k tvs but you can't No, this was a film that said it was offered in 8k and i don't remember what it was now but it was recently and i'm like that i've never how did they jump from 4 to k to 8 Oh well, if it's if it's originally like a seventy millimeter, you can easily make that an eight K or sixteen K or twenty four K. Oh, maybe because some of the uh, f- travel films they showed, the real short ones, were sixty eight millimeter. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, like a um, uh, very famous, uh, maybe not famous is the right word, but a popular one is the early nineties. There's a uh, movie called uh, what's it called? Uh, Baraka. Uh, don't know it. it's very um meditative shall we say there's no story it's a bunch of shots of nature and oh, okay like, animals and monkeys and people you know just random things trying to communicate man's sort of uh place in nature and sort of how the industrialization have cut into it and it's trying to make a comment without actually saying anything it's just a bunch of natural shots and but th- what the guy did was he uh filmed it with 70 millimeter uh, cameras, you know, basically IMAX resolutions, super clear, and they've already got an AK Master even back in the early days. Huh. That's it's not on 4K disc yet, but if you look at the Blu-ray, it's it's it's, it's very, 
it's very pristine because it's coming from a very clean source. With nowadays, everything's digital. Well, digital capture can now easily do 8K, 16K, 20, whatever the case. It's just a resolution really? number. So that part doesn't matter anymore. But on the oh, if you okay. if you have a um what do you call it? Uh, a analog medium like uh, film that can translate to as high resolution as you basically can. So it really doesn't matter either in that respect. But in terms of like consumer TVs, we obviously have 4K nowadays, but they're starting yeah. to sell 8K TVs too. The problem yeah. is the 8K TVs, you don't have anything to feed them. So it's kind of useless right. right now. And plus, it's kind of like, like 3D. The, like 3D well, television. Similar. You know, you don't have it. it. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the sense that uh, you know, you've got to. Well, it's it's similar in the sense that uh, you've got a very small consumer base for it, <laughs> because right. they're all niche niche uh, high end, you know, first early adopters people. But outside of that, you're also looking at like at some point you gotta at home, you're gonna run out of real estate before you uh, accomplish sort of how you can resolve that resolution, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. Yeah, like you you've got to literally have a you know four or five thousand square foot home and then you have a room literally uh-huh. a size of a commercial theater or small auditorium like that and then you can install you know a 4k 8k whatever projector and maybe you can get some because even commercial theaters imax are already at 4k and that's already pretty good i mean I, there, yeah. there's nothing to achieve by going to 8k at home you know anyway, that's a whole nother yeah. topic altogether Let's get into the movie. <laughs> sure. I know we could go on forever. Yes. So, pull, all right. So, let's. Threads. Yeah, I don't think I even announced it earlier, but we're going to talk about uh, um, journey in, the Journey into Night, uh, 1921 film by F.W. Murrow. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about this week. Sure. Uh, which one of us is starting? Yeah, well, starting now. So uh, I would say this is a 1921 uh, German expressionism sort of, I guess, in, in that same vein. I don't know. Oh. It's not 100 percent there, but it's influenced by it for sure. Directed by F. W. Murnau, um, 1921. This is a print that still survives. I believe they found this. I don't know when they found this. I don't know the history of that, but. They did uh, restore it um, late twenty. I want to say twenty twenty ten sometime. I, I don't know exactly when either. Um, so right now, this is probably the earliest available film for F. W. Murnau that we know of. Uh, F. W. Murnau is my favorite film director from the silent era, um, because of his eye. And I, I I think I've communicated this before when we were doing Nosferatu. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love the way he he films the angles and what he's looking at and his focus on character. And thus far, from what I've seen, all of his films have are heavily focused on all of those things, and that, that's why they're all masterpieces, in my opinion. Even his lesser ones, including this one. I mean, a lot of people. Will, say that this isn't this is his best and it's not but it's also i feel like every time he uh does work it's just amazing i mean i just love watching it over and over and over again you know so that's my sort of that's the reason uh, i sort of wanted to to get into it and uh kind of go through someone's filmography and the other reason of course is i have the, a lot of these uh dvd blu-rays and it's time it's high time at i i uh, watch or rewatch most of them again. <laughs> yeah. What's well, so what's your what's your impression of this one? Uh, well, you answered a couple of my questions. I was going to ask if this is considered German expressionism, and then you, I was going to ask why you picked it. Um, I think I when I went to look at this, I know his name so well, and considering what did he die at forty two or something? Thirties, uh, I think. Oh, is it that early? Okay. Well, that's even more. Um, that oh, his 42. Name sorry. I thought it was 30s. Four, 30, 42. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, the fact that he's, you know, his work, his his legacy has survived and people know his name. And there's a foundation because of, you know, f- with his name uh, that handles all this. Um, 
you know, to me, that's just amazing to to be able to, to make your mark. Um, that brief, you know, with that brief a lifespan. Um, I realized I hadn't seen that many of his films. Um, I've s- looked at uh, Canopy and I checkmarked the ones that I uh, probably look at next. Um, but I did see Sunrise recently, and the thing I was kind of surprised about, and maybe I was missing something, but in this film, the the camera seems stationary. Did you notice that? Or oh yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure the the that all of his films are all different in in some ways. Maybe that's it. Because yeah. uh, it just the camera didn't move. It just um, you know, considering Sunrise, where it went everywhere, um, it just I, I was just surprised to see it as stationary as it was. Because that's six years later, right? This is uh, 21, and that... Well, Nosferatu is the next year, wasn't it? And didn't that move around there? I can't remember now. Nosferatu is 22, a couple of years later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, and didn't the camera move around more than we saw in, in this one? Or no? Uh, I It's been too long since I've seen Nosferatu, so I don't remember now. Uh, it, uh, it can. I think it sort of moves around different scenes, but I, I, I do think that he... He does. He only moves it with a reason or purpose. I, I don't think he's always just moving it for the sake of moving it. It really depends on oh, okay. what the the story of the film calls for and whatever it calls for. He'll he'll do it to accomplish. Whatever well, when I watched it, I read as much as I could just to get other people's opinions and to pick out things I didn't, you know, notice. Um, one thing you know that was striking is because it's expressionism. Usually, they use the sets like in. Um, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, yep. the sets kind of expressed everything where it was nature here. Uh, when things were calm, the sea was calm, although it was, yep. seemed windy forever. You know, the yeah. whole thing seemed really windy. Uh, but, um, but otherwise it was calm. And then when, you know, the emotions were in turmoil, uh, the sea was in turmoil. Um, I love how they brought in, um, fight, uh, fight, uh, comrade fight, just standing <laughs> as the boat was coming closer and yep. closer. And that was, um, you know, that was really an interesting uh, visual. Um, Helena, uh, d- her character didn't seem all that fleshed out. Uh, I really don't know what she was about. Uh, they said they grew up together. She wrote in her diary for exposition, but um, they seemed older in life to be at this stage in life. Uh, I was just kind of surprised to see that um the whole thing it, it was tragedy all the way around uh no one seemed to come out of it um you know clean uh, when i was watching i'm just going through my notes um oh when Igel invited um helena to the cabaret for a birthday uh he was looking bored checking his timepiece and it's funny how lily noticed that and she was trying to get his attention I thought it was interesting that it was a one-woman show, uh, so if anything happened to her, there goes the show. I'm wondering if that was because of um, the bu- the film itself was a lower budget. Uh, the costume of her and the flower, I thought that was funny. Um, you know, that, that'd make a great Halloween costume. Uh, I'm wondering how many other times she had tried this, which she did to the doctor before she finally landed him. You know, how many times did she go through this? But um, back to Helena, I mean, was she wealthy? Uh, she seemed to only live with her, um, with the maid. I got the sense that the house was large, but, y- you know, you didn't, you only saw pieces of it. It just seemed, she seemed, you know, really two-dimensional to me. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still a pleasure to see this movie. Um, I like how they um, gave you the visual of uh, the doctor coming in uh, just the way um, Conrad did, standing in the boat, uh, approaching the scene just before he catches the um, Lily and uh, Conrad together. Uh, I forgot his Darmala, I think his name is. Um, yeah, um, it's not too much else. It was definitely a melodrama. Oh, I know, I had a question. Now, German Expressionism, does that have anything to do with over-gesturing, you know, the way they were doing it? Uh, that probably more just has to do with the acting style, which is uh, a, a melodrama, which is what it basically amounted to. So, 
Um, yeah, it, it just seemed really overdone. And yes, one of one of the commenters said that even um, uh, even the director uh, wasn't happy with the way you know everyone was acting. And that's correct. Yeah, uh, it looked like that Conrad was uh, redoing his role um, in Doctor Caligari, and it was out of place here. Uh, and it was more in fitting with Dr. Caligari and Orla, uh, Orlac, um, the hands of Orlac. Uh, but it just didn't, it just seemed weird here. Um, I don't know. That's just kind of my thoughts about it. What was yours? Uh, yeah, I mean, as I kind of stated, is, uh, I I really loved sort of all of F.W. Moreno's films and our really wish that his uh i mean he did something like six or seven more movies before this so by the time he got yeah. here he's already yeah. well seasoned person you know yeah and i really wish some of those lost films were uncovered because he did uh, a take on the hunchback he did a take on dr jekyll and hyde and i really w- would have liked to to see some oh, of yeah. those or there's one about Satan. <laughs> Sounded interesting, <laughs> just in general, because of uh, what he did with uh, Faust later on. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've seen that already. I but... have, but it's been too long, so I'd have to watch it again. I actually yeah. have it on DVD. Yeah. yeah, so it's like it's a, it's just amazing. Uh, I just love his angles and the way he uses uh, visual effects uh, to tell a story, in addition to sort of the actings and storylines and plot points and so forth. So, did you catch the um, when um, Lily was already with um, Dermala, and he was losing his sight, and she came back to the doctor to get his help? And when she came into the room, did you notice that he put his hand, his the back of his hand, up to his forehead? You know, in a in a in an exaggerated gesture. Oh yeah, I mean everything's exaggerated. Well, it just reminded me of Cal Burnett when she used to do Nora Desmond. It was just like it was <laughs> almost right out of that. Uh, yeah, it, it just it's just funny because I mean I, um, yeah I I can't if if he wasn't happy with the way the acting went on I'm just surprised that he didn't say something while he was there like no don't do that. Well, I, I think part of this you gotta. Um... At least some of the uh, googling and research that I found was that there's some background about this production, which is that it's a co-production, with Danish, uh, German, Danish co-production. Ah. So they basically were. I mean, I'm reading in between lines. I don't think these article or research, primary research, said anything about this. But my take is that uh, maybe the uh, Danish, because the the main star is Olaf Fons or something, and he's Danish actor, okay, director, producer, and so on. And he's one of the biggest stars around that time uh, during the silent film era. And so I feel like he's had, at that point, after Myrna was starting out, I'm not sure he he would have had power and say gotcha. enough uh, over that. And, and also because it's a friendly sort of between two countries, European collaboration, this is all pre-war. <laughs> I mean, pre-World uh-huh. War II, that is. Um. And with all that kind of politic aside, I'm reading again all this conjecture. Uh, uh-huh. I guess I got to do more research. But um, d- there's just a the feeling that he kind of had to live with it, and you know, basically kind of live with what he has and kind of make the best of it. <laughs> well, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, considering his later work, um, it just didn't. I mean, because he was a perfectionist, especially. I heard a yes. lot about Faust. Uh, where he was driving them all crazy on Faust, uh, because he really reminds me of another director that um, re- another uh, director, modern director. I'm a huge fan of was uh, David Fincher, and of course oh, Fincher, I don't know. I, huh? I don't know him. So David Fincher directed uh, Fight Club. Um, oh, Michael okay. Douglas the Game. Uh, he did Panic Room, Zodiac recently. Uh, he's going to actually do a, a Netflix movie called Mank about uh, Erwin Mankiewicz. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, writing the screenplay for uh, Orson Welles' um, Citizen Kane. So that's the movie he's, he's directing. And his screenplay was by his dad, I think, who did research and write the screen, wrote the screen, who, who was already dead. But So he's done stuff like that. Um, and he's a, a perfectionist, too. And 
he would take hundreds of takes for actors. Okay. And so he's, he's like, he, he really is one of the old school type directors yeah. who just wants perfection and he's kind of hard to work with. I guess he has a reputation for that. Yeah. But anyways, um, the reason why I'm bringing that into sort of focus with after W. Myrna is because I like his work ethic and also just the way he perceives his uh, films, even though this is not his uh, best work. If you look at all the different camera angles, uh-huh. they incorporate, um, I don't know how to properly pronounce this, but they, they call this the camera spiel or the chamber play into a film play. And this is, he did this about about at least uh, half a year, a year before it became more popular in the film realm, where basically you film the set and or scene of a film with multiple perspectives. You have a foreground, background, and sometimes you have plot points going on concurrently between the background and the foreground. Not much of that occurs, but there are, there's enough of it where the drama plays out because... Um, in the foreground and the background. So if you look at the different shots of different scenes of the, like in the beginning, um, when he and uh, Helen, the main character, the doctor and Helen were in, I think her uh, residence, it was like a side room. It was elongated. In other words, mm-hmm. there's depth to the room. Yep. So he would enter to the right. And then all of a sudden she would approach in the back of the room to the front and you'd be at the front, of course, like a stage, right? It's replicating okay. a stage or chamber play. And he's looking at the audience and she would come up and then he would kind of go back. And so you get all, it's what's called um, contrast, right? You got something going on in the background, you got something going on in the foreground. And basically, even though the shots are stagnant and that camera isn't moving much, it's actually up to the actors to uh, give you that action, give you that, what normally the camera movement would provide. And sometimes there are cuts uh, and they're all done for specific reasons and reasons in terms of character moving the character and story and plot forward but more often than not it, it heavily relies on what's called a tableau um style uh of filmmaking which is tied to the the, the camera spiel concept uh-huh. and in fact um uh, directors like akira kurosawa would later you know uh three four or five decades later continue to use that same concept as well um where yeah. y- you would you would contrast something going on in the foreground with the background always. And uh, that makes the film scenes much more interesting than if you just had a, a, a flat plane to compose your maison scene, right? The framing of the, the shots. Uh huh. Now so you gave me a new way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and see, the, I, I knew I was missing something. It had to be. Uh, and you gave it to me. And that's what I love about the, these films. Um, and, and, F.W. Myrna, of course, was a, a friend of Max Reinhardt, who, of course, isn't the only person, but is, um, I think, the person that's tied most heavily with the German expression. Because the expressionist movement didn't uh, originate in film. It started on stage first, right, at the turn yeah. of the century. And he was one of the hands to popularize it. And, of course, Myrna, being his friend, would have known about all of his stuff that he's been doing, even before Caligari. And of course, this is now post, I believe, post Caligari. I think that was yeah, 20 or 19 or something like that. It was so, 20, yeah. And so, you know, bringing somebody like uh, Conrad White on board, you know, I think they, they approach filmmaking just like the way we do today. I mean, who wouldn't want a Tom Cruise so that you can draw ticket sales to your films, right? Oh. No matter okay. what you think. And of course... Caligari being so popular, who wouldn't want a Cesar character reappear yeah. again in your film, right? See, there's the context. Yeah, and having said all that, I would say that, yes, in in, in the midst of all the uh, melodramatic acting and all that stuff, which is pretty normal, I guess, for a melodrama of its day, but even then, even for the 20s, people still felt like it was too melodramatic, too... right. A lot of which he obviously couldn't. I, I have a feeling he wasn't able to control, but I still think that Conrad Voigt's performance was pretty brilliant. Between going from uh, blind to seeing, and then seeing to blind again, the transition yeah. of both yeah. were were pretty spectacular. Just, just like the way you were talking about Long Cheney, yeah. um increasing 
uh, Joan Crawford sort of acting, sort of challenging her to to act yeah. better. I feel like that's what happened, and I I don't know if you got the feeling, but I certainly got the feeling that all of the actors and actresses got better acting towards the end when uh, Conrad Veidt showed up versus not. I just feel like they were more subtle uh, yeah. towards the end, a lot more more filmic acting or rather than. So you think it was shot linearly? Linearly? I don't know. I I don't. I didn't. Uh, I don't know how it was done or how it was done. But when he was, I know why they do the ending for us now. But that was yeah. after um, Gene Harlow. Right. What uh, I'm saying is, they. I, I feel like when he's around him, the actor, they must. It, it, they. They feel like they need to amp increase their game. You know, acting uh-huh. game. So I don't know. That's just well. Look at Patrick Stewart. He upped everyone's game on Star Trek. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's the big part. I think is the the tableau, mise en scene, and the framing, and how uh, the actors will go back and forth, back and forth between the foreground, uh, background, foreground, background, and it it, it would continue to his next uh, film, which I think is the. Uh, What's his next film? It's about something about um, blood soil or something. Burning soil. That's what it's called. 1922. So he would, he would basically continue to ratchet all this up to the next huh. level. That's a more controlled and more refined. Have uh, you seen it? It's next on the schedule. So Oh, it is? Oh, I'm basically okay. going to go through all F.W. Myrna's filmography. It is kind of the, the, the thing moving forward. Um, okay. Because I have check those off and canopy so I can find them. Yeah, because I have um, all of them. Like you know, many people who collect uh, DVD or Blu-ray, and it, it, it's it's fun to have. I, I I can't remember if I've either seen it before. The big ones I certainly have seen before, like the the Nosferatu, the Sunrises, the the Faust, and stuff like that. And even the Last Laugh, but I, I can't remember if I've either. I can't get the last. Oh no, not that one. Um... The man who laughed. I can't get that one anywhere. Unless the I last laugh. Uh, no, 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 not that one. Uh, the man who laughed. The one that looks like the Joker from Batman. Oh, that. Yeah, that's not Murno. That's somebody else. Oh, oh, uh, that's, okay, that's just Conrad. Yeah, that's just Conrad, the Joker, prototypical Joker for Batman. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so. I've been dying to see that and I can't get it. It. It's got to be on YouTube. I gotta imagine. I tried. You tried? I really oh. tried. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I haven't searched for it recently. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, if you find it, let me know. Check the. Uh, have you checked the local public library? See if they have a DVD copy. I actually haven't tried them since uh, all this COVID. It's happened. So everything's uh, open up. So you should, you give it, it is. a try. Okay. The, sure. Yeah. The, you know sure. about the Commonwealth catalog, right? So. Uh yeah, I'm sure I can find it again. I moved within the last year, so I have to refind everything. Yeah. What happens is you can access all of the state's libraries, not right. just your towns, right? So yeah, beyond um, your network. Well, everything became streaming, so it's been a while since I've had to do this, so I have to well, reacquaint myself. Well, not everything, right? <laughs> As well, we've <obviously>. discovered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I do want to see that again. Yes. Uh, yes. Anyway, um, so anyway, that's that's the thing that I really enjoy about this particular film, is that all of the tableau shots, all of the the, the nuances that get into this, um, the technical aspect. I, I, even though the story is not the greatest in, in the acting, I do feel like he often uh the technical aspect uh, it might personally i i feel like override some of that and also i just feel like all of his films are very modern like it's just the feel and texture of his films even though it's a silent movie feels like it was something that could have been made in the last five ten years just poor uh, helena just a, Right, or Helena. But, She's just laying in bed. <laughs> but you you get my point. It's like when you watch this, it, it really doesn't feel like a film f- that's more amateurish. It's really like a uh, yeah. a master who is in control of the filmic language and uh-huh. who just doesn't even know that himself, I think. Because some of the... Now, can you explain a term that you've been using uh, to me? Because I'm not quite sure what that means. A which Which term? Tableau. Oh, tableau is like um, it's the it's the same thing as similar things to mise en scene, but it's more it applies to more just a regular uh, classical painting, like like oh. on, on canvases for painters. Uh-huh. And if you want, if you look at a painting, they'll often use that word um, 
Italian, French, I'm sure there's some version of it where it's basically how the characters are displayed um, against in relation to one another in the painting itself on the canvas. So if you could oh. look at The Last Supper, you you know, like yeah. there's so so many versions of The Last Supper. Well, that's kind of a tableau of Christ is in the center and it's apostles, and blah, 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 on the left and right. That's a tableau. That's like a yeah. a way okay. you frame the the way the human beings are um, stretched yeah, out but, across the frame. Gotcha. So, so basically it's set up as if it was a painting, only it's film. That's, that's the beauty of his films. That's why I really enjoy his films is that um, – so not only is it technically proficient, well done, a master craftsman from a technical uh, perspective, um, this film in particular, I, I I do think that also there are thematic things. He, you know, he is heavily influenced not just by the his friend uh, Max Reinhardt's uh, expressionism, but also by early um, Ibsen poems and plays. I don't know if you remember listening to... Um, Victor Schromstrom's uh, film uh, "A Man There Was" nineteen seventeen. It's a fifty minute short, um, and in that movie, it's man against nature. Well, you know, if there's conflict in the relationships and their feelings of the characters in the in the short movie, uh, the storm he he would shoot uh, exterior scenic uh, landscape shots of storms, uh, just th- you know going, th- you know, okay, you know, just to and fro and, and, and the ocean, you know, foaming and stuff like that. It, it really represents the external. It's an external representation of the inner turmoil of the characters in the plot. And that's happening. Which is usually expressionism. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, expressionism tends to be more about sets. Generally it's about oh, okay. the, the basically expressionism. I, I think I define it more like, uh, yes, you can use lighting to create shadows, but in expressionism sets, the shadows are painted into the sets. Yes. <laughs> so if you look, well, Caligari is a perfect example. Yeah, it's perfect because if you look at that, not all of shadows are created by lights. It's literally painted into the sets, right? right? So, um, that's what I think of when I think of expressionism. It's typically some sort of sets or some dark and gloomy uh, settings like that, and and there are certainly share of that in this film but it's more just about the feel of that right um the the, yeah. the darker psyches of the human mind and what what torment it is that the character wants to he's he, they all they all want to be where, like the grass is greener they want to be where they're not right uh-huh. so the character the contrast the motif the the is 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 basically it's like you've got two halves you've got a contradiction of things in the film you got like man and nature right so he again i think he must have seen uh, a man there was the 1970 victor Sh- schrodram uh film because is he does contrast who, is 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 that the swedish director yeah or, that's the okay that's yeah. the one that was hooked up with igmar bergman and he did the phantom carriage the, that's that guy yeah i he did do the phantom carriage yes that's the guy yes okay so yeah. that's I saw him. Uh, I think it's man and wife, man and his wife, or or man and his woman, or so, something like that. And that sounds similar. I don't, a man there I don't was. If, yeah, we did a episode uh, uh, a few months back about. His, it was uh, about show. him and his and this woman that he fell in love with, and they had to leave whatever su- settlement they were in, and it, she had a baby, and so they were off in the wilderness. It's is it that one? It, it is that one because it's about him and nature and how the okay the waves are crashing. Uh, to and yeah, and from. I think they froze at the end, and she threw her baby off the cliff. You know. Something like that. It's been a while, oh, but the point yeah, is, d- yeah, the point is, I think you know he was influenced by the play and sort of the the depressing natures of the the Nordic right. plays, uh, right. and so, but also by the story, and also I I, I got to imagine by the filmmaking from Victor Schoenje himself, and so when he watched it, he, it must have influenced him here because he replicated some of that concept of the, okay. the the emotional turmoil inner turmoil displayed with nature but he does play with nature a lot throughout all of his filmography okay. uh, i would say uh nosferatu is a big one too because it often cuts to the exterior what's happening with the light and dark the and sun the and the moon yeah. and all sorts of interesting things with nature uh-huh. uh, because it's a commentary on how the 
the the the vampire creature is is it a something that's natural or is it something that's anyway it's a very interesting in, in insight that he has so he's doing it again here too even though it's earlier he's doing a contrast between man and nature between rural and city like when they're in the city okay. and versus the farm life between husband and wife right between night and day blindness and sight and also huh. a doctor set against a uh, a blind painter, right? In in that, um, you're, you're uh, making love me triangle. want to watch it again. You're making me want to watch it again, right? But do you get the part where, like, yeah, there are so many things that is uh, below the surface where right. these characters represent so much. There's so much richness uh, beyond just the surface level. Which you know, it you're there are many things that are just like yes, there are melodrama and there's it's 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 a very conventional sort of. Uh, thing done like that but based on all of the technical uh, prowess that the director is able to overcome i think some of the acting but also beyond that that the screenplay and the, the ideas he's trying to communicate is it's so rich i think you know okay and you're able to yeah i didn't see it that way so um i'm looking forward to looking at it with new eyes yeah and uh and it's also um, predates some of the uh, trends that would take on uh, more popularity later. Uh, such a, after this, uh, there will be a lot more tableau type films come out. After this, there'll be a lot more of that chamber play concept of of, of the way they're fit, framing things. Um, in this okay, article, that's another question. Chamber play. Yes. What is that? It's like a. It's just a theatrical version of what you're just watching. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a type of play where they use, they make great use of space. Uh huh. So, okay. I'm going to read it. Just a little from, things trip me up. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read it from this article that I'll link in the show notes for everyone here for the first time. Filmmakers try to incorporate the camera spiel, uh, chamber play into a film play, a strong affecting plot with only a handful of characters has been developed through the, Smallest psychological details, the unity of locale and characters, the intimate interweaving of the atmospheric mood and characters' emotional life. All this has been achieved with the most sophisticated use of facial expressions and cinematic direction. And so then he goes on to say that there are other films like Shattered and Baxter's and 1921 and after, but uh, that this came out before both of those. Now, a perfect illustration, I'm not reading anymore, but the perfect illustration of this point is like, when they're at the, the dance uh, between his fiance mm -hmm. and his friends, and they're sitting in a, I guess a uh, a box seat, I guess, yeah, looking at yep. the the thing. Notice that during that scene, a normal movie would just show you the entire audience, would show you all the multiple box seats, would show you the entire stage, would show you the the chamber orchestra, right, right. Mm -hmm. So in this film, he didn't care about any of those things. In this film, because of the concept of the cam camera spiel with the chamber play concept, we just read the definition of. He's only concerned about the uh, the doctor, the Helena, the the fiance, the, the dancer, looking out beyond the the curtain. Yeah. Currently in in play, so his entire camera angles, it's it's so tightly wound on just these characters. It never shows you the chamber orchestra. It never shows you the audience. It never shows you any of the other boxes except for, you know, in the surroundings as the camera pans mm -hmm. out a little bit. Does that make sense? So yeah. even in that one little scene, you're only looking at the through the perspective of these four characters, and that's it. It doesn't give you uh, more than that. It, it wants you to focus heavily on just what these characters and what their relationship to one another is or was or will be. Mm -hmm. so that's what i love about it it, yeah. it doesn't it there's just not an ounce of flat fat when he's making these films it's so concentrated like he wants you to be focused on you know why he's not even looking at the dancer he's it's like almost he's like checking his watch i almost expect him to take his watch out and tap his fingers you know yeah on, on the on the on the wall and say hey when is this going to be done <laughs> well lily noticed it yeah Oh, so I those like are when, some um, of my thoughts about it. I like when uh, 
he she asked him to talk about himself, and then she says, "All right, this is boring." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a uh, foreshadowing, right, to later yeah. on when truly he is boring, and she's moved on. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of my, I guess I don't, I didn't write this down, but I, one of the things I really enjoyed was their framing of um. Sometimes I just love the technical aspect of F.W. Murano. I mean, sometimes I love his other characterizations and stuff like that. But with uh, when uh, what's her, the dancer Lily, the character is uh, looking out the window after the doctor leaves for some reason. And uh-huh. oh, and this is where okay, so she just met the uh, the blind guy, right? A pa- artist painter, and then is now back at the house. Uh, she closes the door and then she's just looking out the window. The way it's framed is like the tableau or a painting. It's almost like a painting out of the Renaissance era uh, where she's standing by like a woman by the window. It just almost sounds like a painting itself. Like, it's just amazing. You pause at that scene and just admire it. She's fra- like, have you heard this theory where your brain remembers somebody if they're standing in a, a door frame? Okay, yeah. Like, you, you almost take a photograph of them in your brain. Have right. you heard of this theory? Yeah. Yeah, so she stood by two frames. So somehow, psychologically, he knew that our brain would remember that, like, y- y- implicitly. Not, we don't even consciously register that. But his art- artistic vision would be that she stood between two window frames. And, like, for me, I f- forever will remember that, you know. She would move from left window to the the, the right window, uh, just forever, just still photography. Like it's like, almost like a still photography, you know. Yeah. A painting, you know. His shots are just so beautiful, you know, of nature, of characters, of just the different emotions that they have and how they relate to each other. Um. Anyways, uh, back to Conrad a little bit. I mean, he definitely is. I think parroting some of these, you know, some lists from the uh, Caligari, Caligari, but also yeah. like, man, the way he, just the way he is, like the person, like what a strange, like looking fellow, right? Like the way he rises out of bed, it's almost yeah. like, I mean, just like Caligari, it's like, it's almost like that he had a, um, air, a not, a, air cannon, but some sort of, uh, contraption to lift him physically out of the box right but he was just in bed and he was just trying to rise up out of bed in this movie and it felt like it, it was back in color guy again so. i think my favorite scene with him is when he was starting to lose his sight and he opened yes. up the book that was just that was over the top but that was fun yeah i love all that or when the doctor was yelling at him and he just shuts his eyes and wait for him to go away <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this uh, film, I think um, uh, I read, this is probably not totally accurate, but maybe it is. Some IMDb reviewers saying they saw a longer version of this cut. Uh, that's not available anywhere. So, uh, I, you know, I think there are shots and scenes missing for this film, like a lot of silent films. That oh, would yeah. have potentially made it more um, streamlined, made it more... make make certain scenes make sense i think uh, right. that it it's very jittery i think in some places which is like there was this scene where it was the doctor helen and the uh guy the i, I forgot the painter's name he can see oh. now yeah i wrote it down Stermal. yeah so he can see now and they're all having dinner together Stermalar. So he has dinner together before he comes to his house and have dinner again. You know, there's like this weird juxtaposition where he's like, he's having dinner. They're shaking hands with each other. And and of course, you know, the, you know, uh, Helen and that main character, the blind guy who who can now see is flirting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The lightning struck. What I'm saying is like they had dinner before he came to his house and had dinner again. It's a weird cut. It's like a weird editing you know like i feel oh, like you mean in that scene yeah, yeah it, it felt like the, that that, that I cut missed. should have been later instead of earlier or something like that right. something got messed up I, I think in that editing i don't know that's just my yeah i didn't catch that at all um yeah so that would be an illustration of 
potentially why it, it needed additional scenes to fill out some of that confusing jittery cuts. Well, they find films in the weirdest spots. You must have heard of Joan of Arc and where they found that one. No, where did they find that one? Um, I want to say the right. It was um, in a mental institute. I don't know the correct way to say that, but um, it was in a closet. Uh, whoever ran that was friends with the guy who made the film, and he asked for a copy for himself, and then he put it aside. The other copy, the the, the original was destroyed, so he had the pristine copy that we now see. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Again, Criterion. Love that. Love that channel. <laughs> yeah. It says uh, here in 1981, an employee of the there you go. Dyke Mark Hospital Mental Institution in Oslo found several film canisters in janitor's closet that were labeled as being the Passion of Joanna Arc. The canisters were sent yeah. to Norwegian Film Institute with their first store for three years until finally examined. Interesting. This and that's is when the, I found out about the different film stock and where he used um, the more current film stock that could register more detail and so yes. no one wore makeup. Uh, right. And so you saw the people the way they looked and the actors hated that because right. they were so close up and no makeup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, that was a good film and they had two scores to watch that with, at least two, maybe three. Oh, there's always uh, multiple scores nowadays. Silent films. But these were uh, legitimate with it, uh, and they were just very different from each other. One was more religious, and the other one uh, was something else. Yeah, what I mean is even the original showings of films, they often have multiple versions yeah. or That's true. multiple artists contributing scores. But again, growing up, I always thought the silent films were like I would watch the Beverly Hillbillies, and they'd make a joke over when they go back home to the mountain. They were showing a silent film of someone tied to the railroad tracks, and there's Pearl playing the the, uh, the piano. And I said, right. okay, that's a silent film. Or even the <laughs> Avengers. The Avengers, when Mrs. Peel was put on, um, they were going to saw her in half. Yeah. Uh, and it, and then the guy had to play the piano <laughs> to go with it. So it was that, I swear it's the same song they all use. Yeah, it's uh, it's just part of it's uh, yeah, it's uh, I think it's the entertainer, right? Da 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 da. No, this was be the Avengers was before that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's the sixties. Um, I, I don't know what it is. I'm sure I I could look it up, but um, but it, it once you heard it, you'd say okay. It just seemed like it would always go with a film like that, where someone's uh, the perils of Pauline. She would always be in trouble, <laughs> and there'd be you know yeah. that one tune they play. Yeah, I mean that's probably had a uh had an influence on a lot of people who were uh who were yeah. uh but now it's like watching a a regular movie cuz the music fits. Yes, yes. I'm I'm hoping um you know post covid that um uh, I was originally um I don't know if you remember Bob was in the podcast. Oh, Bob yeah. and I were going to actually try to go to uh, Beverly uh theater. Uh-huh to sure. watch uh, Metropolis with the Allo Ooh. Orchestra. Now, Allo Orchestra is local in Brookline. They're based out of Brookline. And so they often have local performances, um, such as that score. They wrote their well, own like, I have Sundays score. and Tuesdays off, so either one works. <laughs> well, like I said, after COVID and everything, and I don't know yeah. how long that will be. Um, and assuming th- theaters and cinemas still exist. and uh, I know. Yeah. Yeah, the world's changed. It's, the world's changed. It's like, it's like 9-11, only worse. Yeah, so anyway. So one of these days, uh, you'll check out a uh, live performance, hopefully, if they oh, I'd allow love that. To. Yeah, because um, I keep to. saying this, and I think you've probably heard of this if you listen to the podcast many times, is silent films are unique in the sense that you've really got to watch it live Yeah, with with some sort of live music, like a music concert it really uh, silent films were meant to be enjoyed like a music concert i think and if you remember any good music concerts it, you just will remember that you know it really yeah you know lives with you in terms of memory and that's the same it ought to be for silent films but unfortunately we don't have a lot of uh well up until now i've never met anyone that actually cared about silence yeah they look at me and roll their eyes whenever i talk about it it's like all right <laughs> Well, that's because they hadn't seen it, right? Once they see it, they, no, they, they've they seen get, it. They yeah. just they, you just either you like it or you don't. Um, it's true. Everyone has their thing. That's I mean, right. I don't like sports, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, any uh, parting thoughts or last words about this particular film? 
Uh, no, I just now I look at it again with um, with what you said, and I can look at it differently because I wasn't saying what you were saying, what you were talking about. Um, so it's always it's always nice to discover something different, uh, another point of view. That's what this podcast is all about: different yeah. points of views. <laughs> well, I've been a fan. Thank you, and thanks for, thanks for uh, hopping on here in a brief, uh, short notice, and watching this film and doing all that good stuff. So, all right, uh, do you have any social media presence, or do you have stuff online that you'd like to no, promote, no, or anything like uh, that? Okay, nothing. If no. you had any, this would be a good time and place for it. So, um, yeah, I appreciate it, but uh, someday y- maybe, who knows? You can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. That's watching silent films, plural dot wordpress dot com. You can send us an email at watching silent films at gmail dot com. If you have any thoughts, questions, or comments, just like Adam did. Now he's here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and we're like everywhere, I think, on uh Twitter, the Facebooks, the socials, or wherever they're called, um, all watching silent films and stuff like that. And please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It does help um us push kind of get higher on visibility with people who are film fans and help uh, new fans find um, new film fans who are interested in silence find us uh, quickly. So, and that's pretty much it this week. So thanks Adam. And thanks for listeners. And uh, we'll chat again soon. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night.